I have bought every single MacBook ever. My bank account hates me. My parents are thoroughly unimpressed. But you're about to see for the first time ever how Apple has managed to turn the Mac from a laughing stock to, for a lot of people, what is the most desirable computer on the planet. And it started in 1989. This was a time when the entire concept of a laptop was still a new one. And so what we actually have here is more accurately a computer that happens to be portable. Just about. <laughs> but make no mistake, the Macintosh Portable was impressive because it was powered by Motorola's first ever widely produced processor, the Motorola 68000 at 16 megahertz, which was a full-on desktop class chip now made workable on the go. <coughs> I can't believe this thing was once a laptop. It's like carrying your entire suitcase when you go on holiday. Wait, it actually is the luggage. <laughs> Unbelievable. Press this down to open it up. I was trying to have a nice little cozy, comfortable typing experience, but my goodness. I mean, to be fair to them, the keyboard feels fantastic. Super satisfying. Oh yeah, completely forgot. Early computers used trackballs instead of track pads to control your pointer. Let's see if this thing even turns on. Wow. Oh, also check this out though. It is shockingly repairable. Just take the back off and change the parts you want to change. Like literally, that's the battery. I'll give up all this for a machine that's 35 years old. Kind of like it. Aesthetically, it holds up far better than I was expecting. But then the crown jewel here is this display. It's a super expensive type of screen called an active matrix panel, which basically means that every single pixel is attached to its own transistor, which actively uses power to maintain that pixel's current on or off state. It's very battery intensive, but the benefit is that it can deliver extreme responsiveness and sharpness versus the passive matrix displays that other computers were using. But uh, there was a price to pay for tech like this. In fact, 18, thousand dollars in today's money. Which is why it's not exactly surprising that Apple only sold these in the tens of thousands. So, two years later, Apple took another stab at it. They launched a whole lineup of laptops, the PowerBook 100, 140, and 170. And you might notice something about this 100 in particular, it actually looks like a laptop. <laughs> Apple realized from their Macintosh Portable that they didn't exactly have the most experience building compact machines. So this time around, they actually hired in Sony to do the manufacturing, which is weird to think about because there is no way in hell that Apple would ask Sony for help now. Okay, that was so much easier than the last one. This is such a massive jump from the Macintosh portable. And this is such a cool feature. It has built-in retractable stands on the side. And you can see, this is where the idea of putting the trackball in the center of the chassis was actually introduced. More importantly, let's see what you can do with it. Wow, welcome to Macintosh, it says. The whole machine has this quite majestic, gentle whirring to it. I actually really don't mind controlling it with a trackball either. It's surprisingly precise. There's just quite a lot of screen ghosting as you move around. A little bit less fun to type on for sure. Oh, but this is cool. Look, you've got dials to manually mess with contrast and brightness. That's ironically so much faster than it is to do now. Let's click on the Apple. System software 7.0.1. They used to call the bin the waste basket. No way. And when you close an app, it does a little poof out of existence. Now, this generation wasn't some sort of next level power jump, but the fact that they managed to cram in the same processor and two to four times the RAM into a body a fraction of the size, that was the achievement. Not to mention that by making the machine so much more efficiently, they could cut the price from what was $18,000 in today's money to just $5,000. Within just the first generation of PowerBooks, Apple was selling in the hundreds of thousands. And the hype was starting to build. So what Apple really had to do was to capitalize on that excitement. They had to take what people really liked about the PowerBook and double down on it, which is what led us to the PowerBook 500. It is hard to articulate just how much of a leap this thing is. It feels so much more pro. Actually, the hinge has held up surprisingly well over the years. They've done a cool job making the keyboard edgeless. See what it looks like on the inside. Everyone has had a different boot up sound so far. <laughs> this is where they got rid of the trackball. Apple didn't like the balls. No, I can't say that. Got a trackpad here, and a tiny one at that. Look at this load up screen. Unbelievable. You can see all the circuitry behind. Apple wouldn't dare put that in now. Mm, keyboard's a little springy. Oh. Huh? Did that just die on us? RIP. Welcome to Apple. Tell me, how can I help you today? My PowerBook 500 is dead. I need to speak with a person. Hang on just a second while I transfer you. How can we help you today? My laptop is dead. Oh. The MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, which one? No, it's a, a PowerBook 520C. 
That's a bit of an older machine. I've tried batteries, I've tried power supplies, it's just not booting. It literally died in front of me. Yeah, at this point, um, there is nothing serviceable with it. So it's not under warranty? Not at 1994. Our warranty is usually run one year. I think I bought extended. Yeah, our extended warranty can run up to two years. Well, that's, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. You take care. Right. He was surprisingly attentive. <laughs> I thought he was going to hang up on me. What I find kind of crazy about this is that Apple designed this computer specifically with upgradability in mind. They didn't mount the CPU on the main motherboard, but instead a whole separate daughter board that you can just swap out. I mean, compare that to Apple now. I guess when you're the underdog, you want to do everything you can to show how pro-consumer you are. This was a time when Apple did need to prove themselves. But to be fair, I don't imagine that the vast majority would even be upgrading, considering that this thing's power was up to three times the 100s. And that in the early days of computers, that's really all it was about. The entire computer race was not about having the super differentiated, super advanced softwares that we have now. It was basically just a competition to see who could get the highest number in performance. Apple did a couple of refresh versions of these laptops over the next couple of years. But the next proper game changer came three years after the 500 with the PowerBook G3 1997. So at least at this point, I have been born. And this might well be the most excitement that's ever existed for an Apple computer mostly thanks to what it's powered by. As their market power and their scale started to grow, Apple was no longer going to settle for just using an off-the-shelf Motorola chip, and so decided to form an alliance with them and IBM to produce a series of chips called PowerPC. And this machine was its first mainstream debut. This was the fastest laptop in the world, and it, it wasn't even close. We're talking 250 to 500 megahertz chips, while also doubling the previous generation's RAM up to a behusive 32 megabytes. But something interesting was also happening within Apple around this time. So Steve Jobs, the guy who founded the company and who was responsible for a lot of its early success, basically got kicked out because of a massive disagreement with the board of directors. But 1997 was when he returned as CEO. And when he came back, he wasn't happy with what the company had done and he started making a lot of changes very quickly. You can even see it happening in real time watching the PowerBook G3s progress with each revision of them. To the point where by the time Apple released the final G3 PowerBooks, the top of the line so-called Wall Street G3s at 7,300 dollars in today's money, they looked so different. Ooh, unexpectedly weighty, this one. It just doesn't look like a MacBook. The fact that the screen is so expansive and the bezel so small, it does feel very high-end. So still very much the laptop that's trying to do everything. I kind of wish modern MacBooks had a bit of curvature on. It makes it way nicer for your palms. There we go. That's the modern Apple sound. So they finally stuck with something. You can tell this is the computer to buy for bragging rights. Oh, and this is the old school Apple Beach Ball for the loading. It's such a nice screen in comparison. Internet Explorer. We're talking about a time when Safari was just going to see the elephants. I've got like a watch for a loading icon. Look at that. Adobe Photoshop 6.0. It actually starts up faster than the current one does. And the Apple logo in the corner is the shiny, colorful one. Wow, remember iTunes. Sounds pretty good. I guess the perfect example to show the transition phase that Apple was in was you got the old school multicolored Apple logo on the inside and then the new white logo on the outside. But to properly see Steve Jobs in full force, you only need to look at what came next iBook. From 1997 onwards, Steve Jobs was the CEO, and he appointed a man called Johnny Ive as the design lead for the products. And this is where you notice Apple's designs start to separate from the more generic laptop designs that other companies were using. So the iBook was Apple realizing that while of course they could make a ton of money selling top-of-the-line power books to investment bankers, they also needed to offer something that a teacher or a student could afford. So this Barbie toilet seat of a laptop was just $3,000. It was Apple's most affordable laptop ever. If you take a shot of me on the toilet with this. I really wish more laptops were this experimental. Every single key is transparent. You can see the mechanism underneath it. Very interesting looking mouse buttons as well. Oh, okay, buzzing to life. So this is Mac OS version 10, and that's taken it a big leap forward to what we have today. You can see the skeletons, the, the foundations of those features from the very, very early machines. Kind of like they knew what they wanted to build and very, very slowly got there. All the icons are three-dimensional, everything has its own inner and outer shadow and reflections. It's very pleasant to look at. It's got chess. I used to play the odd game of chess in my time, but I'm pretty sure the game has just crashed. Just scared to face a former England chess team player. 
this thing was actually quite a big deal. It was also the first mass consumer product to offer Wi-Fi network connectivity, which was then branded by Apple as Airport Wireless Networking. This was a big deal. And the way it was demoed to the audience for the very first time will probably go down in the history books. Listen to the audience as Steve Jobs shows this off by passing the laptop through a hula hoop to truly clarify to people that it was, yes, wireless. Impressive enough to earn the iBook the number one spot in the US portable consumer market for a while after launch. Apple did make a number of updates to the iBook over the years, but what I think is even more interesting is what Apple did for the pros. At this point, Apple very clearly understood that they wanted to make both mid-range machines and super high-end machines. How do you make something that a pro would be willing to spend $6,000 in today's money on? Well, make it out of titanium. In a way that someone could just take one look at and instantly know that whoever's using it is a high flyer. This is the PowerBook G4. And it's the first time Apple properly experimented with metal in the body. Safe to say it worked. Oh, the metal makes such a difference. There's not even really a hint of it creaking. Oh, and they finally integrated the mouse buttons into the trackpad module. Got a really nice even border around the screen. You can kind of see it start to resemble the modern day laptop. Pretty sure the bezels here are smaller than they are on some of the most recent ones. And the screen is pretty sharp too. I'm kind of judging that because I can actually tell that the apple in the corner is an apple. Never thought I'd see the day where you can actually see screws on an Apple laptop. I guess you could say modern day Apple prioritizes form over everything else. Whereas this very much feels functional, even if it's not the prettiest. Oh yeah, and the PowerPC G4 chipset basically doubles the performance yet again. We're getting to crazy numbers here. And like, Apple is doing well now. They were making better computers faster and faster computers better. And the sales were trickling up as a result. But there was still a higher ceiling that Apple hadn't quite cracked yet. And this is where the MacBook came from. Steve Jobs strolled onto stage in 2006 and basically said, we're kind of done with power. Meaning that while of course Apple laptops would continue to get more powerful, they didn't want power to be the focus. Since the PowerBook brand was created while Steve Jobs was out of the company, this was his chance for a fresh start. He wanted the Mac brand that he'd first established to be the front and center, and for it to represent not just power, but just the overall quality of the experience. So they released two forms of laptop in a single year, MacBook and the MacBook Pro. Even the base MacBook is so nice. They swapped out the standard charging cable for MagSafe, they added in a webcam that they labeled as the iSight camera, and they swapped out the PowerPC processors for Intel Core Duo CPUs, blaming their partner IBM for being sloppy and not making the chips power efficient enough. Although this is kind of funny because the entire time Apple was using PowerPC chips, they would just release teaser after teaser, poking fun at how much worse Intel was until they switched to Intel, at which point they changed their tune to, this is hard to believe, but this is what the numbers tell us. Four to five times faster than the PowerBook G4. These things are screamers. Or in other words, if we are four times more powerful than last gen, we're already at 192 times the power of the original. And we've still got over 15 years left to go till now. And all of this is super impressive, considering that this is just $1,700 in today's money. We're even more affordable by far than even the iBook was. This laptop for me brings back so many memories. This is the one we'd have in the school music halls. I know it's all made out of plastic, but it still feels quite high end. This is gen one of Maxi. Nope. <laughs> it's almost like it's trying to resume from a past state. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't put that on. Stop recording. Fans are really kicking up a fuss today. This wallpaper was iconic. Oh, you got the dog that now hides underneath. I wonder if this has the same garage band we used to use. This is exactly how I remember it. I used to spend so much time just prattling around making loops of my own, just adding far too many instruments in and just seeing how it sounded. For me, this was the first fun computer I used. We need to see what the first MacBook webcam actually looked like. Hey, the camera's actually surprisingly, I mean, it's a bit laggy, but it's, it's good quality. I mean, we're talking about a time where they still used to call it video conferencing. And then the MacBook Pro, which keeps the same Intel Core Duo, but it's more the quality of everything. The metal body, the fact that it has a 1440 by 900 HD display. It's actually really similar looking to the PowerBook. I like the LED light on the latch though. Fun fact, this is actually the last Apple laptop to have a latch. Steve Jobs apparently didn't like them. I really like the silver keyboard. It feels very slick. What is iChat? The first personal video conferencing system that makes it easy to keep in touch with friends. Password, Astley69. This is such a throwback. iChat can't communicate with the account Rick, RIP. They even made a 17 inch version of the Pro, which was an absolute beast that I really wish they'd kept it because it used to give you this desktop class experience with even more room for an even bigger battery inside. There's no doubt that the 2000s was the decade where Apple made the biggest impact on the laptop market because just two years after that, at the start of 2008, 
they would release what would become the best-selling laptop in the world. This is probably one of the top three Apple moments of all time. Steve Jobs brought a paper envelope with him to the launch event. He put it down on his stand and revealed to the world a MacBook Air, a laptop that changed the entire paradigm of what to expect from the thinness of a computer, only then to proceed to take the MacBook Air itself out of this paper envelope. Just listen to the crowd. Oh, yes. And then this presentation was basically round of applause after round of applause, as he proceeded to show people that this laptop, half the size of anything else, still had the entirety of the previous MacBook's core features. A powerful Intel Core 2 Duo, full-size keyboard, and the metal construction that Apple had previously saved exclusively for its luxury lineup. I mean, it wasn't cheap by any means, but you can totally see how, if this was your reference point, how desirable this form factor is. It's so nice to finally hold a laptop that isn't a workout. This is where they first introduced the multi-touch trackpad, which I would say made a big difference to how intuitive it was to use macOS. I use gestures a lot nowadays. You can totally see how this took people aback at the time. And in the very same year, the company also released the Unibody MacBook. So this is the successor to the plastic MacBook from 2006, and somehow, somehow, managed to even beat the MacBook Air in sales. Unibody, or at least what Apple means by Unibody, is that the entire laptop is just two pieces. The entire body is one piece, the screen is a second. There's no plastic supporting frames, and the entire thing is made out of metal, so it naturally conducts heat out of the laptop. Plus, environmentally friendly. They used this redesign as an opportunity to get rid of chemicals like arsenic and mercury, and now that the laptops were so simply structured, they all of a sudden became almost completely recyclable. This is sturdy. I like it. It's definitely the most solid feeling MacBook so far. The screen is so bright. I've grown used to squinting. The webcam might actually be slightly worse though, but the laptop is noticeably faster. Oh goodness, <laughs> this browser is no longer supported. <laughs> oh, Apple.com works fine. Well, not really fine, what the hell? <laughs> No one supports tech this old. You can see why this iteration was the best-selling MacBook in history. A lot of people call this the first proper MacBook, because it now has a completely new design that separates it from the PowerBook lineup, the design language that the company's finally settled on. It does also feel like this is the point where Apple realized that, while yes, lots of different kinds of people buy MacBooks, the core market was creators, photo editors, 3D modelers, and these people also needed proper graphics. So Apple started a partnership with Nvidia and kitted out the machine with something a little bit more substantial pushing it to two times more powerful than even the 2006 MacBook. It became very clear very quickly with the sales numbers that Apple had smashed it with this design, which is probably why they gave it the standard spec bumps over the years as they do, but that they didn't change the core concept for a while. But they did realize something else, that now that they had the MacBook Air that was catering to the casual user who just wanted to type documents, they didn't really need the middle of the pack book. So from 2009 onwards, they decided to just rebrand this MacBook as the MacBook Pro and improve the specs a little bit, as you do. The next proper title change only happened in 2012, when Apple decided that this current MacBook wasn't quite enough. While it was pretty high-end, because the core design was initially conceived as a mid-range laptop, it just didn't appeal to people at the very top end who wanted something that was just purely cutting edge. So they launched the world's highest resolution notebook on the market, MacBook Pro Retina Display. Now, Apple had had Retina Display for two years already at this point on their phones, so this wasn't some sort of unheard of concept. But Retina Display for a laptop is a little bit different than Retina Display for a phone. For a smartphone to have a display for which your eyes can't see individual pixels, you might need a 960 by 480 resolution or so. But to have that same sharpness across a 15-inch laptop, it has to be 2880 by 1800 resolution. Considering it's a flagship, this is a surprisingly thin laptop, nearly as thin as the MacBook Air. Oh, the screen is so much better. It's a night and day difference. The logo lights up, which I really like, but is a horrible waste of battery. Apparently, it used to leave a subtle hotspot of light bleeding into the actual display, which funnily enough, this wallpaper might have actually been picked to hide. Mm. Apple's made a lot of refinements here. The trackpad feels smoother than ever. They've integrated the mouse clicks and they feel firm. Keyboard probably peaked here, to be honest. It's better than my current one. Let's have a look at Apple's YouTube channel. 16.9 million. We are actually not as far off as I thought we were. Apple is a company that spends billions of dollars every year making these trailers and promoting them. There are only 3 million subscribers more than us. Our entire team is eight people. Apple probably has 800 people just to sweep their floors. Okay, this has to be a challenge. Editors, make this serious. 2023, this is the year where we overtake Apple. This is the year, eight of us and all of you guys, we come together and we overtake the most subscribed tech company on the planet. And a sub to the channel would be magnificent. That's my audio recorder. <laughs>
Also, what's quite cool is that by this point, Intel had diversified its lineup of chips. It wasn't just about the Core 2 Duo anymore, they had the Intel Core i3, the i5, and i7s. And so naturally, you could kit this thing all the way up to the top tier quad core Intel i7, which, when combined with the GeForce GT 650M graphics, makes it, well, a big jump. Between 10 and 15 times better at modern tasks than the 2008 MacBook, which is crazy. We are 3,840 times the OG machine right now. Apple was on a roll in 2012. The Mac had been growing every single year in sales, but it was at this point that they made some odd decisions. Like in 2015 with the MacBook. Yeah, I know. Completely different laptop, but they've still somehow managed to just call it MacBook. <laughs> the naming convention makes absolutely zero sense. I've touched so many thick ones today. I can't believe how thin this is. It's literally like it's barely there. There's actually so much to like about this computer. It's got a 12 inch proper retina display. It's got a keyboard that, you know, by no means is this like a typewriter like experience, but they've not done a bad job considering how little space the keys actually have to travel. And also they've given this trackpad force touch or two different levels of pressure that it can respond to. Can I have the, uh, uh, beef master. Oh, I forgot how heavy this was. 1989, 2015. Incredible. You can tell that they were trying to go for that same envelope reaction that the Air first created. If this laptop did well, Apple wanted it to be the successor to the Air, and they priced it more affordably than just about any Apple laptop before, but it didn't. This was too fast, too soon to just drop all the ports down to USB-C. They lost full-size USB and they lost the MagSafe charging. Plus, part of the reason that the thing is so thin is because it's completely fanless. But to achieve that, they had to use an ultra low power Intel Core M chip and actually noticeably sacrifice performance unlike the Air. It was just an unnecessary machine and people still kept buying the Air even when this was out. So it wasn't doing a very good job replacing it. And one day Apple just decided to snap it out of existence. And then back to back with this, Apple fudged it again with the MacBook Pro with Touch Bar. They pitched it as a revolutionary new input device and credit where due, it probably could have been one since it does solve the problem of normal keyboard keys being fixed. By digitizing them, you make those keys whatever you want them to be in any given moment. It definitely feels futuristic compared to where we've come from. And given that they combined this with the introduction of a fingerprint scanner and a 50% larger trackpad, I can't have been the only one who saw this get announced and thought, okay, okay. You have my attention. Actually, I know I'm not the only one because this is the laptop that had more online orders than any other MacBook Pro before. And I remember the outrage when people realized they had removed every single port but the USB-Cs and the headphone jack. It's allowed them to keep it streamlined, but yeah, I mean, clearly it was a mistake considering that they added them all back a couple of years later. The touch bar was such a love-hate relationship that I had with this laptop. It's very cool and very fun. Plus you could actually customize it the way that you wanted it, which obviously you can't do with hardwired keys. But in my experience, it also introduced a whole other level of software that could go wrong. There were at least two or three times where my whole laptop was working fine, but it's just, I couldn't adjust any of my settings because the touch bar bugged out. Oh, and I love the fact that the trackpad is so ridiculously huge. It's also using a much newer quad-core Intel i7 and a much newer Radeon 4. Graphics. It's still nothing on the extreme end yet, but just by being newer, we're still 60% faster than the last set. But yeah, the touch bar just didn't really vibe with people. Apple's not usually one to introduce features and then kill them off so quickly, but the truth of it is, A, a lot of pro users want to be able to physically smack their keys while they're typing at 3,000 words per second, and this just doesn't feel the same. And B, while this could be a genuine feature ad, it's one extra thing that Apple and other developers need to code for. And who's going to? To make their app slightly better for such a tiny fraction of the total laptop market. You won't believe what Apple's response was. Their next big flagship Pro MacBook to make up for this mistake and push the boundaries out in the right direction. The MacBook Pro? 16 inch. I kid you not, the last model was 15.4. They've already had 17 in the past, but no, what makes this one special is the fact that it's 16.2 inches. I'm half joking. Obviously I did want to see something a little more experimental and exciting, but I think this was Apple realizing that in the pro user space, people don't want gimmicks. People want all the core features and they want them to all work really well. This was a pretty well-reviewed laptop. At this point, people had got used to the quirks like the touch bar and the lack of ports, but this was quite a substantial upgrade in other ways, like the fact that it has a proper six speaker sound system. Although the webcam was still 720p, which is poor in 2019. Over the years, the cheapest laptop Apple offers has just become more and more affordable, with you now being able to get one for like 999. But the 16 inch Pro feels like where Apple drew a very clear line to definitively separate the Pro laptops in price, with this thing starting at $2,800 in today's money and going all the way up to 7,200 when maxed out. But what they did do for that was to make absolute sure to nail the fundamentals. So you could kit this thing all the way up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, eight terabytes of fast SSD storage, and now not just a quad core in 
Intel Core i7 with the brand new top of the line Octa Core Intel i9. The graphics were still meh, but as a package, we're now looking at a further 40% speed bump. Now, as solid and reliable as these laptops were, it was definitely starting to feel like the entire laptop market had matured, and that all the high end laptops, no matter which company you got them from, were basically the same in terms of the performance, the parts used, the battery life, until Apple launched. M1. The company held an event in 2020 where they officially explained that they were about to start moving away from Intel and transitioning to Apple made M series chips. Chips that were not necessarily beefier than their Intel counterparts, but smarter. They use neural networks, they can solve problems efficiently, and because they originated from mobile chip architecture, where power constraints are a real problem, in the laptop world, the battery life claims were off the charts. And they started this transition with a Mac Mini, a MacBook Air, and a MacBook Pro, all powered by M1. But this was never meant to be the real Pro MacBook. That actually came one year later, the M1 Max. And this announcement event really was something. I remember watching it like, okay, okay. Seems cool. And then they showed the charts. At least according to Apple, this M1 Max chip was not like 20% faster than last year's Intel chips, but like many times more powerful. Not to mention 13 times faster when it comes to graphics. Although that is compared to the integrated graphics within Intel's chip, as opposed to the dedicated graphics that Apple used to put into some of their laptops. What's interesting is that if you run an actual benchmark, it'll tell you that M1 Max is no more powerful than the last gen, but it feels way faster. This is the laptop that I still use every single day because everything just happens so quickly. And anytime I want to add a bit of music to our videos or do a little pass of sound effects, this laptop is so optimized for Apple's own apps that for me, with Final Cut Pro, it just flies. Like I would struggle to get it to lag. Whereas literally the Intel laptop that I used just one generation prior, it would slow down, the fans would go haywire, and it would just get really, really hot. Like I could actually potentially burn myself on it. Oh, and also the webcam is finally 1080p at least. I still don't love the fact that it's a notch display. In the world of hole punch cameras, I really don't see why it needs to be, but at least the rest of the screen is very much bezel-less. They call the screen XDR now, which stands for Extreme Dynamic Range. Oh, and they've updated this again recently with the M2 Max MacBook, which has even longer battery life, newer updated ports and internet speeds, and the M2 Max itself is a full-on 30% improvement over the M1 Max. It's not a huge exterior redesign, but it's only really when we go back to looking at where we started that the real differences start to emerge. From 7.2 kilograms to 2.16, from 256,000 total pixels to 7.7 .7 million, and most impressively, a total power jump of, get your last minute guesses in, approximately 11,000 times. To see the last time I emptied my entire bank account buying every single Xbox ever, that's here. 